Last week, we did one of my favorite shows in a long time. We went up to the little town of Westover, Ontario, just outside of Hamilton. What a pretty little place and super friendly people. Nice to get out of the studio for a day and not wear a suit. The reason I went up there, though, was less happy. There was a slow motion crime going on for six full days. Police were parked on the streets. The place was under siege. A group of two dozen protesters, trespassers, had illegally broken into and occupied a pumping station for an oil pipeline called Line 9, owned by a company called Enbridge. That pipeline has been there for 37 years, by the way, quietly pumping away, and of course it's buried underground, so no one even notices it. The pumping station is above ground and has some buildings. That's what the professional protesters came in from out of town to break into, and it scared everyone. That's what some of the locals told me, at least. It's a small town, a hamlet, really, and unlike in downtown Toronto, parents feel comfortable letting their kids just play in the neighborhood. It's safe, and everyone looks after everyone else, anyways. Except when 20 or more black bloc style anarchists come in from the big city. Now, some of the protesters were presentable enough. Let's call them spoiled liberal rich kids. But some of them were a bit more hardened. Like David Prichitka. He was implicated in the G20 riots in Toronto a few years back. He faced criminal charges until they were finally dropped as part of a larger plea deal. It's not exactly your local Boy Scout who wants to set up a lemonade stand. That's someone who has a very specific skill set causing mayhem and defying police. That's why he came to Westover. That's who was out there. And we showed that information to you last week. We showed you that Prachika was one of their ringleaders. Wouldn't you be afraid if you were the parents of young kids and G20 riders were camped out down the road and were actually staying overnight illegally? You might recall that my colleague, Brian Dunstan, went up there to talk to the trespassers. They blocked him from going on to Ambridge's property to see things. <laughs> Pretty ironic, don't you think? Trespassers stopping us from going on the land. But take a look, the two spokesmen, the ringleaders of this thing, were the aforementioned David Prochitka and a young lady named Alicia Patron. By the time I made it up to Westover a couple of days after Brian, the police finally raided the squatters and arrested and charged about two dozen of them. But Alicia Patron was still up there. Obviously, she wasn't arrested. And a few of her friends were up there, too. And she was running the thing, I mean, giving me official comments and sort of bossing the other protesters around. Anyways, that's by way of background, in case you missed last week's show. It's what we've been talking about here for years, that Canada's environmental extremists are resorting to law-breaking to try to get their way. They lose elections, Stefan Dion's green shift five years ago, the BC NDP five weeks ago. They lose in court. The National Energy Board ruled that the Enbridge's plan to reverse the flow of Line 9 and put Canadian ethical oil in it instead of OPEC conflict oil is fine. And even though 100 environmental activists petitioned them to stop that. So what's an eco-warrior to do? Well, if they can't change the law, I guess they could break the law. Now, in addition to identifying individual protesters, I identified who they were affiliated with. For example, David Prachitka was a G20 rider. A couple of Indian activists, Floyd and Ruby Montour, were fined $350,000 by another court for illegal protests they were involved in. And one of the other affiliations I said was that this protest was sponsored by an environmental group called Environmental Defense. That's a $3.6 million a year lobby group that receives millions of dollars from foreign foundations. Bizarrely, it's also a registered charitable group. And I mentioned all this on TV and in my newspaper column too. Well, yesterday, The Sun received a letter from this lobby firm taking issue with my comments. They want to set the record straight. So in the interest of fairness, let me read to you their letter in its entirety. It was in particular response to my newspaper column, but it applies to the TV show, too. Here it is. They titled it, Environmental Defense, Letter to the Editor, Levant Gets the Facts Wrong on Line 9. We are writing in response to Ezra Levant's article, An Unholy Alliance, which ran across the Sun Media Network on July 1st. Environmental Defense, as a charity, does not engage in civil disobedience and did not sponsor the occupation of an Enbridge pumping station along Line 9. We have been raising awareness among Ontario residents of the risk of oil spills posed by this and other pipeline proposals for the last two years. We'll continue to do this work because we believe it's important for the public to be educated about projects that could impact our drinking water, farmland and climate, and for Canadians to be able to have an informed and rational discussion about how to safeguard an environment in our future. Sarah Winterton, Acting Executive Director, Environmental Defence. Well, look, I'm grateful for the letter. And we've invited Sarah on the show to say her piece. It's a standing invitation. I promise I'll give her the last word in any interview. It's a refreshing change for environmental defense to engage with me. You might recall that when I went up there, their officer, Alicia Patron, spent half her time telling other protesters not to talk to me, even shutting up a native elder, telling him he wasn't allowed to speak.
Where do you live? Six Nations, Oshwegan. Yeah. So how far away is that from here? 35 minutes. Is there a rule yeah. that we weren't going to be talking to this? Uh, oh, oh, is there a rule that, uh, are you, are you yeah. telling Floyd that he can't talk to anybody? Well, I mean, Floyd can talk to whoever Floyd wants to talk to. Okay, do you want to talk to me, Floyd? No, I'll listen to her. I'll listen to her. Listen. Okay, does she tell you what to do? Yeah. So yeah. she's sort of colonizing I'm not your mind. i here, I'm just a supporter. So I'll listen to what they got to say. How do you feel about a young white girl telling an Aboriginal man he can't speak? I think I might be a little darker than uh, Floyd. Hey. No. How do you know that I'm not Aboriginal? No, I don't think I'll talk anymore. I'll listen to Alicia here. Okay, she's your she's your new colonizer. Jeez, remember that? Okay, well, is it true what environmental events uh, wrote to me? They didn't really challenge any particular fact. It's tough to challenge what a TV camera shows. But they rambled on a bit about farmland or something, which is weird because the Line 9 pipeline was built back in 1976, and all that's happening is the direction of the oil flowing in the pipeline is going to be reversed. So farmland, water, whatever, that's really just what a logician would call a non sequitur. What about their main points, though? The two main points, that environmental defense does not engage in civil disobedience and that it did not sponsor the week-long trespass in Westover. Well, on the first point, I think it's pretty clear that what happened in Westover was at the very least civil disobedience. When you break into private property, chain yourselves to equipment, refuse to leave when asked, even when asked by police, even when asked by a court order, and when police have to go in and haul you out and charge you with crimes, yeah, I think that's called civil disobedience at the least. But I think what environmental defense was really trying to say was, whatever happened up there in Westover, it wasn't us. Really? Now, I can see why this is important for them to say. They're a registered charity. I'm pretty sure that the Canada Revenue Agency would look disapprovingly on a registered charity issuing charitable tax receipts that was using its charity money on law-breaking crime sprees instead of, you know, doing charitable things. Environmental Defense is also a registered lobby group. But what elected officials would be willing to meet with a group that has a paramilitary wing People who break into property, defy police, and have to be hauled out by force. Who would meet with such a disreputable group? But the bigger question is, is it true? Was environmental defense involved here or not? Who cares about the spin and who cares about the political fallout? That's not what's important. What's important is what is true. Well, dear reader, let me show you some indisputable truths. This is the Environmental Defense website. You can see their little tree logo in the top left corner, and you can see one of their official campaigns, the Stop Line 9, with the black and red anarchist colors. They have another website called noline9.ca, and if you type that in your computer, you're quickly redirected to another page on the Environmental Defense website. It's their political campaign against the pipeline. Now, let's go back to the crime scene in Westover with its professionally produced posters, and you can see those posters. They're environmental defense official posters. It's like decals on a racing car. They are proudly affiliated with environmental defense. Those signs are everywhere, the ones we just saw on the website. Big signs, little signs. Ones that have the environmental defense website stop line 9ca written on them. Ones that don't. Here's a picture taken by Vice Magazine of one of the posters with the actual tree logo picture in the bottom left. That's Environmental Defense's actual corporate logo at the protest site. That's amazing, isn't it? But you'll notice that in some of the other posters, they've taped over the Environmental Defense logo. They're still using the posters. They're just trying to cover up who sponsored them. I wonder why. I wonder who asked them to do that and why. I, I wonder if they're kicking themselves that they didn't cover up that one poster that Vice Magazine took a picture of. I, I wonder why they're trying to obscure the fact that these posters are from Environmental Defense. Maybe Sarah will tell me if she ever comes on our show. But of course it doesn't matter what, if environmental defense actually had its actual logo on the posters. They're, they're posters. These trespassers were promoting their website. But what about actually environmental defense staff? Well, it won't surprise you that a lobby group that is so obsessed by stopping Line 9 would also write on Twitter in support of these protesters. And that's exactly what Sabrina Bowman did. She works for environmental defense as their climate campaigner. She was promoting the crime scene on Twitter. But who knows? Maybe Sabrina was just an arm's length sympathizer. Maybe the protesters stole the posters from environmental defense. I don't know. I'm just trying to come up with some excuse. How can I square Sarah Winterson's letter to me with the things I'm seeing with my own eyes? Well, maybe Alicia Patron can help me. 
Remember, she's the organizer and spokesman for the trespasser. She's the one who told the sons, Brian Dunstan, he couldn't go on the land. When he showed up, she's the one who told that native elder to shut up. When I went up there, she's the boss. Well, who is she? Well, in a letter she wrote to the Hamilton Spectator newspaper, she, is, uh, and the, uh, the letter was called Hamilton Needs to Stop Pipeline Reversal. She signed her letter as Alicia Patron Environmental Defense, as in she works for them. Uh, back in April, she told an online newspaper in Guelph called the Guelph Peak that she works for environmental defense and other extremist groups. Okay, okay, now maybe she's just impersonating an environmental defense spokesman. I mean, anyone could say they work for environmental defense, right? Well, then there's this inconvenient fact. She... Uh, has access to Environmental Defense's Facebook page where she writes on their behalf. And then this, this is a tough one to explain away. Alicia Patron was the official contact for Environmental Defense for a community meeting they had about the pipeline back in February. So let's recap here. The lobby firm and registered charity, Environmental Defense, is obsessed with stopping this Line 9 pipeline reversal. It's a central campaign for them. They've set up specialty websites about it. They've designed a special poster for it. They have town hall meetings to stop it. They have Facebook pages and letters to the editor about it. When the trespass happens, they don't disown it. They don't reject it. They don't call for protesters to come back in line with the law. They celebrate it. They tweet about it. Their own posters adorn the place. They send their key campaigner, Alicia Patron, to run things, to boss the media around, to boss an Indian elder around to do spin for them. It's true, someone must have told them to cover up some of the environmental defense logos on some of the posters, and they did that on a few of them, but not on all of them. I'm not sure how that would change things anyways, other than to show that they had a guilty mind and were trying to cover something up. But they didn't cover it up very well. You don't send an environmental defense staffer to cheer on a criminal trespass if you're truly concerned about being associated with a crime. What do you think? Here's what I think. I think that for the media party, for most reporters, they'd buy environmental defense's line that they weren't involved because they'd either be too lazy just to check on Google or more likely they'd actually sympathize with environmental defense and environmental extremists. Well, we're not so easily fooled. The only question left is this one. Will the Canada Revenue Agency buy Sarah Winterton's line that environmental defense was shocked, shocked by what happened up in Westover? Or will they finally take charitable status away from an extremist group that has decided if they can't change the law, well, maybe it's easier to break it.